in the singular Mahongwe work in Daper's collection on the left, which makes Brancusi appear derivative, that passage is depicted as a dramatic soaring form to which a flattened panel of cut copper has been applied and affixed around the perimeter. Elegantly attenuated at the summit, the expansiveness of this creation allows the viewer the possibility of projecting features onto the reflective surface. While highly abstract, the Mahongwe work in Berlin's collection on the right is com comparatively replete with detail. At the apex of the lightly convex, semicircular summit of the head, a cylindrical element extends outward at an angle. This passage refers to a distinctive manner of dressing the hair worn by regional notables. The overall silhouette of the form suggests the blade of a knife that is also an insignia of local leaders referencing their status and role as defenders of family interests. The expanse of surface is sheathed in skillfully applied filaments and bands of copper and brass that dominate while the features of the applied circular eyes and narrow ridge of the nose are concentrated in the lower half of the head. Coda sculptors also exploited the possibilities of alternating, projecting, and recessed passages in their definition of the head. In the work on the left, the prominence of the forehead's convexity has been enhanced through the dramatic transition to a heart-shaped configuration scooped out below the brows. The bold red copper ovoid eyes punctuated by iron pupils are applied to a contrasting brass surface and are its commanding focal points. The importance of the head is further elaborated through the petal-like elements that extend out to frame the perimeter. These formal devices are amplified on a more monumental scale by the work on the right. In that interpretation, the face projects out as a convex oval that is expanded by the flat lateral lobes and the crescent balanced at the summit. The wide aperture of the mouth exposes sharp, filed teeth, emphasizing the ancestor's role as fierce protector and aggressive advocate. The iron bands that extend in parallel diagonals across the copper cheeks refer to tears that mourn his loss. Isolation of the head and pronounced emphasis on sensory acuity through exaggerated facial features is also apparent in the wood sculptures produced by Tsogo carvers on the left and right. The work on the left shows you a facial configuration that is very similar to that embraced by Kota sculptors. A transversal band circumscribes the summit and sides of the head Below the reddish brown of the rounded raised forehead, the brows delineate a flattened heart-like configuration in contrasting white. Features of the eyes and mouth are accentuated as raised ovals that project from the surface. The quiet serenity of this interpretation contrasts powerfully with the version on the right. It's raised circular eyes. Actually, I'm sorry, I have a missing image here, so I'm going to skip to um, the, this um, work on the screen right now, which is a teke figurative relic receptacle of a male ancestor, uh, a genre that um, emphasized the depiction of renowned chiefs carved by teke masters, um, in which the ancestor is um, positioned in an attentive posture, seated with hands placed on either knee. Uh, his commanding stare is accentuated by European manufactured buttons and in some in other instances nails obtained through trade. Wende artists similarly sought to suggest the immediacy of an esteemed ancestor's gaze they did so by concentrating upon capturing a representation of a given subject's facial features during their lifetime. That discrete element was eventually posthumously affixed to the summit of the body. The master Makosa of Kinyoni, 
the author of the work on the screen that is um, in the final gallery of the exhibition, was renowned for the lengths to which he customized his imagery by making meaningful visual references to his subjects through distinguishing features such as filed teeth or facial tattoos. In the film footage in the exhibition, we see the completion of one such work in 1927, documented by Swedish Protestant missionaries. Um, and in one of the opening scenes of that film clip, we see Makosa stitching the head to the summit of a closely related work. The responsiveness of venerated ancestors to appeals for intervention by living family members was conveyed by regional artists through the gestures and postures of reliquary sculpture. This is apparent in the freestanding commemorative portraits of Bangwa chiefs that were periodically removed from their shrines to animate important rites, sanctioning the transfer of leadership from one generation to the next and securing the land's fertility. The fact that these representations were identified with the essence of an individual forebearer is apparent in the degree to which Bangwa sculptors placed a premium on distinguishing their subjects with customized attributes. The author of the work um, that introduces um, one of the sections of the exhibition that you see on the screen is by the master Atu Atsa, and he rendered, a, a, in this work, um, a chief by the name of Phocia as a vital and active presence with lightly bent knees and elbows, his hands grasping items of regalia. In this instance, those attributes of power held forth consist of a ceremonial uh, horn, uh, drinking horn, and pipe. Figurative elements from Fang reliquaries either stood poised at the summit of a relic receptacle with knees bent or were seated so that the buttocks rested on the rim with legs extended down the side of the front. These stances complement their role in Bieri ancestor rites as both sentinels and participants in a family's devotional life. Often they appear expectant, hands resting on their thighs or knees. Other pronounced gestures further underscore the ancestor's protective role. Two male figures collected in southern Cameroon by the German colonial official George Zenker were created by the same Ngumba master and articulate this idea in subtly different ways. In the work on the left, now in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the figure brandishes an animal horn menacingly in his proper right hand as if it were a dagger. An emblem of initiates into the ancestor cult, such horns were immersed in the relic receptacle to invest them with mystical powers and were blown upon to invoke ancestors and disperse harmful spirits. In the work on the right, the same kind of baton for dispensing a fortifying blessing is apparent as the visual nexus of the composition, shielding the body of the figure on the right and held firmly in both his hands parallel to his torso. A frequently depicted gesture of benediction and devotional offering that is is that in which the subject's hands are cupped and extended outward in many Fang figures, such as this great masterpiece on loan from the Musée d'Aper in Paris. The great couple in the Peabody collection at Harvard assumes other contrasting attitudes. While the female's hands on the right are clenched to suggest a state of active readiness, her male counterpart holds out a miniature figure. The manner in which this small being is cradled in both hands is reminiscent of Fang elders cradling their cherished family relics during Bieri rites. Most importantly of all, it portrays the responsiveness of ancestors to the most critical prayer directed to them by the living, that they may assure renewal of the lineage through enhancing its fertility.